Welcome one, welcome all. I am Bridger and welcome back to Axis Empires. We are in the summer, I have to move that, summer of 1938 uh, here. We've had an exciting early part of the war over in the Pacific with Japan having a mostly unmitigated course of luck in the Chinese theater. However, that luck ran out when they attempted to get the Netherlands East Indies to join them. And in fact, it joined the Allies instead, which means that real, as far as I can tell, the main difference is that this strategic hex is now going to count against the Axis until the Americans get in the war. Arguably a good thing because of how broken the system is, but it's not important. Um, the other element of that is that they'll probably be able to build a defensive unit here at some point before the war begins. Uh, but either way, Japan wasn't be able to attack the Netherlands East Indies until they went to war with the United States. But now uh, they'll be a little bit more prepared, perhaps. So that having been said, over in Europe, things are proceeding apace. The uh, Germans also had some luck and yet some not luck. They managed to get Denmark uh, as a uh, or the Danemark, as it were, as a German dependent, but not without Sweden uh, sort of shifting a little bit towards the allies. So that certainly went against what they would have preferred. We'll see how things turn out. Let's continue and discard all of these. Oops, we never quite, there we go. Never quite got rid of those. I don't know why you have to do this twice. It's kind of weird, but anyway, these are going away and Border Disputes goes back to their hand. Now, we are on the beginning of the sequence of play, seasonal victory point check phase. We did do that check at the end of the last turn to see the current strategic value in Europe is zero, and the current strategic value in the Pacific is plus one. So all political DRMs are going to be plus one over there. However, uh, we don't have any delay roll modifications because it is not limited war yet. Uh, that's worth pointing out. Okay. Seasonal phase, option card segment. That's where we are. Germans reveal Ribbentrop Diplomacy, a rather daring and dashing card. If they can roll a two on one of the next three uh, rolls, then they will have paid for what they wanted to get out of this card. But for now, they are going to place two steps from their force pool. And that will be these two right back into Berlin. And then they will roll for their shipbuilding. Really hoping to get the Bismarck this time. They need a one. They got it. Finally, the Bismarck is going to enter the turn track. Now, we don't know where exactly it's going to come out, but it is now finally on the docket. They could also choose the Graf Zeppelin, but I don't think they're going to need a carrier if they can't even defend their carrier with any battleship. So we're going to start with the Bismarck. And then they can also build the Tirpitz. Interestingly, they can build even better battleships after the Tirpitz. They then get go from a 4-6 to a 5-7, and they're still quite fast. So the German battleships, if they can nail a bunch more rolls, will get even better. Uh, and they can work really well as raiders because they're so fast, those battle cruisers. Anyway, that having been said... The Germans now have to pick a new card, and we have Demand Switzerland on the docket. And at this point, the Germans are praying that the Allies have not yet played guarantees. If the Allies have played guarantees, then this is going to go very badly, very fast. But they they, they think it's a pretty, it's, it's it would be very rare for the Allies to play guarantees in the very first time they could play it in the summer. Um, mostly because they just, they have other cards that can do better things for them in the summer. Guarantees has no benefits being played in the summer versus any other time. So that's the German plan. Try to take advantage of Switzerland being unsupported by the allies and put some political and military pressure on them to give in to the German cause. And that would give them an extra hex to swing into France during the upcoming, uh, situation. So that having been said, let's go ahead and play the die roll game here for Ribbentrop Diplomacy. Minus one to the die roll. Oh, they got a two to a one. It's conflicting plans. No results. Didn't quite get they were looking for. They got two more chances. We'll see if they can do it. Moving on over to Japan now. This is a big turn for Japan. Uh, if you're just joining us, Japan has done a very good job wiping out most of the nationalist Chinese. Yunnan is the last remaining, though Hopei is deciding whether they want to join the war. They're starting to lean towards the West now. And 
Unfortunately for the West, Sichuan has actually just given in to Japan and said, fine, uh, we don't want a war. Uh, we'll join you. We're, we're not going to go outside our own borders, though. We're just going to not join the Allies. And at this point in time, the, uh, the Allies have to figure out what they're going to do about this Chinese situation. If they can put one of these, uh, they need to get the, the Yunnan units out of there, actually. I just realized they, why did they do that? Oh, now I recall. They were going to turn these two one-steppers into the headquarters unit. That was their plan. But they also didn't expect uh, Canton to fall right after that. Well, they were... Unfortunately, they didn't leave any room to put on any Nationalist Chinese. But they're going to try to hold on to this so that the Nationalist Chinese can eventually come back out. So, let's see what Japan's card is, shall we? Flip and Japanese mobilization, as expected. One Imperial Directive card must be removed so we've already talked about those last time. I think Jet Fighters is going away. Uh, I think that's another one that benefits you if you go against Russia more. So we're going to make sure Jet Fighters goes away. So we've got three left to choose from later on. And I think we have to remove one more before the end. So we really only get to choose two of those, if, we, if at all. So next, we're going to add some stuff to the Force Pool and to the Delay Box. Oh yeah, this Force Pool looks way better now that we've got all of these detachments. We've got some colonial units we can add in here. We've got some tons more one-steppers. Beautiful. And another colonial unit there. That is, oh, that's the Russian colonial unit. We basically need that to be placed somewhere. We're not going to place it by accident. The Russian colonial can only be played if we ever go to war with Russia, which we're not going to do. So for all intents and purposes, I think I might just delete it here. We're just going to delete that. We'll remake it if we have to because of some weird situation that occurs later. So they now have a decent number of units in their force pool to build. Awesome. Then in the Japanese political events segment, they are allowed to voluntarily remove any policy marker they want, thereby declaring war on that particular uh, faction's units. In this case, they are going to be doing that against the British. Oh, they have to pick their new card first. Economic expansion going to be very valuable for next next year. Maybe the tail end of this year, but at the very least, it'll be very very valuable next year. Uh, and the quit India marker. Where is that? That's coming out. Uh, I think tail end. Unfortunately, we got a poor roll on that, so it's not coming out for a while. The Axis, though. Uh, last thing they need to do before we move on to the declaration of war against the British is we need to roll on the shipbuilding table. They need a one to a three. Damn, man, that's three rolls in a row. They haven't gotten a ship. That's really bad news for the Axis, despite all the other things that are going their way. So now we need to do all of the things that occur when a policy is removed. Really, all we need to do now is remove the lapsed treaty policy from Great Britain, and they are now at war, along with nationalist China. That is bad news for them because they have not rearmed. They're in a poor position here. But in the support segment, we have a couple of things to do. So as far as I can tell, at any point during the support segment, the Axis player can use the base attack or sub patrol and or sub patrol element. This is during its support segment, so there's no specific time. So we're going to go ahead and use that base attack procedure, uh, no, the sub-patrol procedure first. So the sub-patrol sub procedure says that we first select an X-boat and uh, have it place in any on-station box on the map. So let's find the on-station box for the Java C. There it is. On-station. So we're placing that in the Java Sea because it's adjacent to Singapore. So that's the plan there. And then roll on the sub patrol table on the right, no modifiers. A two is a carrier spotted. Attack the carrier with the lowest speed factor. Beautiful. So now we, uh, that's actually fantastic. They're hoping to get a good hit here. So in this case, there's only the one carrier, the CVL Eagle, the light carrier Eagle, and the uh, Axis naval uh, I boat here. The submarine is going to roll two dice. So they're hoping for fives and or sixes. Oh, they got two misses. And now the I boat goes to the naval warfare delay box, if I remember correctly. Yes, it goes to the naval warfare delay box. So it might be back next uh, ne in the near future to run another uh, sub patrol, but maybe not. 
all right, we took our shot. We missed with the subs. Now we're going to use the base attack procedure. So during a support segment, the phasing faction, that's Japan, made by Form 1 base attack raid. So we're going to be raiding the fleet that's in the Singapore harbor. We're hoping to catch them in the harbor, and that is what this base attack table here represents. On a one or a two, we manage to catch them in the harbor. On a three, the skies are overcast, and so we can't really see what we're what we're going in. We can't navigate properly. We miss our shot. Four or five, the target isn't in the harbor at the moment. It is out patrolling or something, and we miss. On a six, they catch us coming in and get the opportunity to either scramble out of the harbor out of our way or scramble out of the harbor into our way in the hopes of fighting us in actual combat as opposed to getting bombed Pearl Harbor style. So phasing faction has to form a raid task force of ships or LBAs. We're gonna form it of LBAs. In this case, I'm sorry, of ships. Um, in this case, we're forming it out of the Formosa port fleet uh, area, which is these ships here. So we're going to first roll a die and add one to give us the maximum size that this sh fleet can be. That is the intelligence roll. It is not as good as a normal fleet formation, but it is a two. So we only get to send three ships. All right. Well, I guess the three ships we're going to send are the two uh, heavy carriers and one light carrier. I'm a little concerned that we don't have anything to deal with a counterstroke here. Oh boy, do we send a battleship along with them instead? I think we got to. I don't think Japan can afford to take that risk. Let's send one of our battleships along with them just in case it turns into a day action. Because if it turns into a day action, we really wish we'd rolled more than a two, but I don't think they can afford this luck roll. Can they? They had something else they were planning to do with the luck roll. No, I think this is the time. They really could use a three or a four. Let's find out what they get. Or a six. Okay, three. I mean, they're going to take it. Take what they can get. That will let them bring a an additional light carrier to this raid, making it a good deal more effective. They were really hoping for a six because that would let them bring all their carriers as well as some supporting battleships just in case the raid gets discovered. But in this, in this uh, situation, that's the case. So they've got the raid task force. Now step two. Uh, placeless ships in the port hex containing... I'm not going to move them to the port hex. You know what they are. They're coming over here. Uh, and let's see. Make speed checks as necessary. They do need to make speed checks because they're coming from Formosa and they could do any attack within the China Sea. So if those ships were uh, at Sarawak or if they were at um, Saigon here, then they could attack without problem. But because they're crossing a larger distance, we're trying to check to see if they make it there in time for the attack. So let's go ahead and roll for each ship First, this carrier makes it automatically. The Soryu is fast enough to do so. The Kaga needs a five or less. It got it. The, uh, the Ryoto needs a five or less. Got it. And the Congo needs a five or less. Got it. Okay, good news for Japan. They did pass all their speed checks. So they were able to make it at this extended range attack without being spotted. Uh, and now we roll on the base attack table. And there are no modifiers here because we didn't use a CV strike unit because we're not in range at the moment to place a CV strike. We need a, a naval port, uh, a naval base on this sea zone in order to actually place down a CV fleet to make it a sustained base attack. So no luck there, but we will roll to see what we get. We're hoping for a one or a two. Oh, a five is the target away. At least it wasn't a six. So that's disappointing. All right, and because those units uh, were used, they are going to be unavailable during the rest of the turn. I'm just going to leave them over here to remind us that they are unavailable, uh, and they'll go back to that, to whatever fleet we want at the beginning of uh, the very end of this turn, technically speaking. All right, well, that is very disappointing for the allies, uh, for, the, for the Axis, rather. Now, the good news is that the allies don't have any... Uh, fleet markers over here just yet. So they can't contest what the Axis are going to do right now. It is still the support segment. So they are going to have to put down their support units. And let me see, how do they want to do this? I think they definitely want to attack Sarawak and get Brunei. They want that port, that naval base that allows them to eventually move units down and attack Mala uh, Malaya and also to do a more direct attack against the port next turn with better potential results. That means they need to pull out their surface fleet and place it in this all-sea hex. And we know when we place a surface fleet 
in an all sea hex. We need a naval base of the same nationality on that on that uh, sea zone, which we have. Formosa is on uh, a dual port that is on actually triple port. It's on three different sea zones, including the South China Sea. And we need a fleet unit path, not in the same sea zone. Uh, we, and then that is, if it's successfully placed, it must place a beachhead minus one marker. The British are unable to contest because they do not have an air or naval base close enough and they have no support units that they can use to contest with. So this is uncontested. This unit is now going to go to the regular delay box because it wasn't contested. Uh, technically, I need to decide what comprised that particular thing. It has to be a minimum of two ships. So we'll send out two cruisers, since we know the enemy can't respond, to assist with that landing. And then we get to place a beachhead on, oops, on its minus one side. So let's flip that over, place it here, rotate it clockwise. There we go. I think that's going to be the end of our support segment, unless we wanted to have a CV strike assist with this attack. Uh, oh, we can't do that though, because it is mud. So we can't have the CV strike help us there, nor can we have an air unit help us there, even if we had one. So I believe that is the limit of Japan's attacks against the British. We're going to perform a landing here, which is good. We're going to attack here, which is good, but we don't have the assets that we'll have in 1941 or whenever we declare total war, then we get a huge number of assets that have been prepared over a long period of time called Operation Z that would let us strike many more places simultaneously. This is very early for Japan. They can only do a limited number of things. So I think we're done with the support segment now. We're moving on to the organization segment. They can combine up some units, and I think they might do that. So this flips over to three, but maybe what we want to do is flip this. Hmm. We want to attack this now. If we want to do that, then flipping these units doesn't make a ton of sense. Let's think about this. These guys aren't going to be available for that attack. So I don't think that we want to worry about that. For now, we're going to send this back to the force pool and we'll have some significantly stronger defensive force here uh, than we would otherwise. Instead of three, we now have four. So... That is probably the extent of our combinations as Japan. Now we are going to move on to operational movement. So from Formosa, we're going to uh, use, where's our convoy? Our convoy is over here. We have to remove our convoy over to here. And then from Formosa, we will travel to the port on the beachhead during operational move. We will also move, let's see. I think we want to just move everybody down here and then have one, two to there. Yep, that looks correct. I want to kind of leave this unit up here in Wuhan because if the allies happen to get an ally support resistance result, they could just snipe that detachment and then Wuhan would go back into uh, allied hands. Oh, but the problem is if I move everybody down, then I can't occupy Changsha and the nationalists can pop up right behind me. That's not, a, not okay. So we'll have to avoid that possibility. We'll have to leave a unit there in Changsha and hopefully put down a detachment or something there later. All right. Um, I'm kind of tempted to remove the logistics marker on a future turn and move it further inland because this is not a great spot for it anymore, but I can't remove it just yet. I have to wait until the very next one. In the meantime, we still get to put some stuff on a coast. Well, not necessarily. I'm thinking we might want to put it over here and bring it down there. So we could remove this and have this unit walk over. It's a bit dangerous to do it this way. Or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got an idea. Yeah. We're going to remove this during the logistics segment because we don't want... In Nanking, if we put reinforcements here, the best they can do is quickly ride the rails to the north. They can't go south and we're trying to fight in Yunnan. So I think we're either going to use the logistics marker down here in Papa or we're going to move it over here. But now that we have Canton, we can fairly quickly shuffle reinforcements by Navy route over to Canton and then back up into Yunnan. Whoops, I didn't mean to move them. Okay, so that's the plan for operational movement. Do we have any other operational moves? So maybe the air units need to move further down. Uh, they can go in a port, so this seems like a perfect spot for them. Uh, they can now 
cover most of the, I think I want to relocate them to Hong Kong when we get a chance. One, two, three, four, nine, exactly nine from Hong Kong to Brunei. So if we have them in Hong Kong, they can assist up here or they can be relocated via air to assist the defense of Brunei at some point in the future. All right. Now, where do we go from here? We look around and determine if there's any other moves we have to make. I don't think operational is done. Okay, so we're going to do uh, one attack right here. We know that we are four to one with raw odds, and they have a city hex, and they have a uh, limited stacking hex, and those two are counting against each other. So we ply a... a, a um, a city hex in our favor and a limited stacking hex against us. And just so you're, you're you're familiar with how that looks, if I can find it, there we go. Over here, you can see the terrain effects chart that tells us that a city gives one shift to the left and a limited stacking hex gives one shift to the right. So why does it give one shift to the right? Because it rep limited stacking hexes represent small islands like Iwo Jima, for example, or in this case, it's a small peninsula slash island of Hong Kong. And that is a very bad place for defense because you have nowhere to fall back to. If anything goes wrong, you can't fall back and recover and then reform your line. You're just going to lose. So that's why it's counting against them. So four to one with uh, one shift in our favor, one shift for the city against us, and one shift for the mud against us. So we roll the die. It's a three on the two to one or our three to one table, which is a DR1, which is perfect for Japan sends that guy packing, and one of these units walks in and conquers Hong Kong. So now we look at the strategic hex tracker, and we get to add an extra, uh, extra one for the axis on... Why can't I find it? Oh, that's weird. Only the first word is bolded. I wonder if that was on purpose or if that's a mistake. Dutch Harbor. Hong Kong. Um, those are the only two that are there. Anyway. That has been uh, acquired. So on the following phase, we're gonna maybe maybe get axes tied here very early. I want to see what that does, and I kind of don't at the same time. <laughs> I don't know that that opens up any good things for the axes. All right. So that being the only attack that Japan was planning for this turn, we're now going to move on to reserve movement. In the reserve movement, this unit can walk in and capture Brunei. And that is va beautiful, valuable. We've got a port right there. Uh, and then also in reserve movement, we can use the convoy one more time to send this unit down to Brunei as well. I'm wondering if we can try to take our heavy hitters down to somewhere over here to help against Singapore. But I think we keep the heavy hitters here to try to finish off Yunnan as fast as possible. We're doing very well in China and pushing that advantage might be the best option for us. Anyway. That looks like it's going to be the end of the Axis phase uh, here. Final administrative phase, war and peace, conditional events. No, I think, I think they're done. So we're heading over to the British in Europe, and we're going to grab whatever card they've got, the Little Entente. So Ribbentrop diplomacy is being countered by the Western allies negotiating with the Central European countries. So the French grab one step and then they have to put out their next card, which is going to be Western guarantees. They're playing it a little bit early. The historical play was here. So they're playing it two turns early. Um, technically, I think it's playable at any point up to here, but I think it makes the most sense to play it in either winter or spring. Um, so we'll see how that uh, plays out for them. They're playing it a little bit early this time. France gets a free step. And for France, that is going to be... Hmm. Probably this guy here. And then what comes next is... Oh, the Allies have to roll for shipbuilding. Here's Britain. Claimed it. Yep. France on a one. Nope. U.S. on a 1 to a 3? No. Okay, some luck for Japan there that U.S. did not nail their shipbuilding. Uh, now, we got a political event segment for a Little Entente. Diplomatic success could be... Yes, it is a diplomatic success central, which means that the British roll on the central area table right here. 4 down to a 3 is Czechoslovakia. The Allies are going to add an influence to Czechoslovakia. Well, that is going to be a bit of a thorn in the Axis craw here. 
We'll see how badly it hurts. Ideally would have been Poland or maybe even Hungary or Austria would have been slightly better, but you know, let's, let's not, uh, let's not split hairs. Now that we are aware of the Japanese intentions on the Pacific map, the West really has to ask themselves, what are they going to do here? Um, does that change their card play? Actually, I didn't actually think about that. Um, when did they get their first surfish uh, fleet over here? Card five? No, they must have already put it in the delay box or did we just add it to... No, we put Western guarantees up there. I'm sorry, I take it back. They've already got their home fleet. It came out with, I think, card number two. Yep. And they will get Force H during the outbreak of war when pre-war ends or military victory is applied. So for now, they have to decide if they want to send this surface fleet over to the Pacific. That would be very... Well, no, actually, they can't decide that right now. I'm sorry. I take it back. I'm thinking of the wrong thing. They can, they can decide that when they play French mobilization. No sooner. They have to wait for a Pacific commitment to send that... Um, that surface fleet marker over there. What they can decide is whether they want to send some more ships over there and or uh, what kind of ships they want to send. So they can already see that the ships that they have would not be super valuable. Oh, sorry, I just realized. Technically, I haven't played with SK before, so this only just occurred to me. The British could have used a scratch defense fleet to try and contest the placement of the Axis uh, fleet there. And that would have stopped the beachhead landing, potentially, if the Allies had won. Now, the chance of them winning is pretty low because they would have only been able to bring one light carrier, a battleship, and maybe a couple of cruisers. The Axis were going to be bringing a lot more. Let's find out what the Axis would have been bringing to the fl to the fight, I kind of set these guys aside as a possible um, thing, but let's redo it. They would first, when they were placing this unit, have to roll an intelligence roll to see how many ships they could bring. And they would have been able to bring three plus six. So they would have been able to bring nine, which is like all these cruisers, because what do I have? Why, why would I not? Um, and then they could bring a carrier and then they could bring two battleships maybe. So that would be the force that's coming to escort this landing, right? The Japanese don't have any reason to hold anything back because they know the Allies don't have any offensive power. Uh, and so they're bringing everything they can bring to bear. And the Allies have to decide if they're going to fight two battleships, a light carrier, and six cruisers with what one plus a die roll worth of ships. They might not even be able to come with this much stuff. In fact, the odds are that they'll be able to come with maybe three ships instead of nine. So I think the Allies simply would not have contested this. The odds were very much against them if they tried to use a scratch defense fleet. If they could have used a full surface fleet, then they would have been six plus a die roll, and they might have been close to parity with the Axis. But as it stands, only coming in with like three or four cruisers, or like a light carrier and a battleship and one cruiser against all those Japanese cruisers, which are considerably better, by the way. All the Japanese cruisers roll twos, whereas the Allied cruisers only roll one die. So the Japanese cruisers considerably better, although they are weaker on armor for the most part compared to the Allied cruisers, it looks like. No, it's about the same. The Allies have a couple of slightly heavier cruisers, the three defense factor cruisers. They have half, half heavy cruisers, half lighter cruisers, I guess. Uh, anyway... I think we're just going to call that a push. The Allies decided not to intervene because the Scratch Defense Fleet would not have been able to form with enough forces. Anyway, now that we've got that figured out, what ships do we want to send down there to help? We can send ships down there and they can come back in time to, to, to defend against potential case yellow uh, invasion of London. So what ships do we have available here that the West could send down? Uh, so we've got quite, not quite as many as I'd have thought. I think because we already, did we already send any? Yeah, we already sent some down last turn. So maybe now that we know that it actually is for real happening over there, they definitely send the Courageous for two turns on the turn track here. They send the Courageous down and they send the Hood and the Nelson and maybe one more battleship here. 
they're going to leave some behind just so they don't get fully caught with their pants down um, enough to keep the German uh, Navy in check in case something crazy happens. But I think technically what people have said, you can send the entirety of the home fleet down there and just not worry about the German Navy at all. I'm going to play more practically because it makes more sense. Uh, and that that will be the situation we're dealing with here. Okay, so the Allies have done that. And now they have to decide. They've decided on their next card. I think that's all for them. Let's head over to the Pacific because now, now, the West on the Pacific map has a lot of decisions to make. They revealed the card League of Nations and they're kicking themselves for not playing British rearmament at this point. Now they can apply European commitment. That means if they wanted to, they could send a fleet back to Europe, but they don't have any fleets to send and they definitely don't want to. They do get to add one U.S. convoy to the delay box. Goody. And then they have to decide on their next card and they already failed the, the role for the um, shipbuilding. So let's take a look at their options here. Um, They've got Scratch Offensive. Caught at close range is a nice thing they could potentially use. Surprise Attack lets them move those units around. Global Raiders, let's see. During any naval construction segment when a war marker is in the Western Offensive. Now I understand how Surprise Attack should work. You you break down a headquarters on a previous turn. or Oh, okay. Also can be picked up from the delay box. It's weird that they even allow you to do it from the map. Support units coming from the map does make sense. Um, so this is during a replacement segment. So it's before support. So they return to your force pool. That's pretty good. We got to remember to keep that in mind. But anyway, we're talking about a fall Commonwealth mobilization. It has to be, right? There's nothing. This is where they get their surface fleet. It gives them a step. It lets them put out some important bases over to give them a line of communication over to Australia. I don't think there's a better option here. So I think they're definitely going to make that their pending card. They really need to. It gives the British a lot more options. So now that they've chosen their card, they don't have any steps to gain during the option card segment. Now they need to figure out what they're going to do. They don't have any mobile forces on the board. They can't move any British units. So we're really just looking at what's going on over here. And as discussed earlier, they're going to combine... That's weird. They're going to combine these two Yunnan steps and turn that into the Nationalist Headquarters unit. So that is going to be very valuable, but... Uh, brittle, because it's not really <laughs> covered by much at the moment. So, uh, oh, 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 they do get to build a single unit of their choice before that happens. So they can't build a nationalist unit there because it was fully stacked. That's kind of somehow they accidentally screw themselves over there. But they can build this expeditionary unit here, and then they can figure out where that's going to go now. So now that we're done with all of the proper moves here, we can have this guy, the HQ can fall back one step. This guy can move forward. So now they have a total of five defense there, including the headquarters. And that's not too bad. So that's probably all they want to move here. They don't have anything they can do with support units. The American subs, unfortunately, cannot participate at the moment. So that's probably going to be it for them. They get to the conditional events phase, and this is where nice things happen. If Britain is not a pack, they get to build a British step. So they can take this opportunity to build a British step in Australia and try to be ready to do something with that, at the very least defend Townsville. They don't have to necessarily worry about this unless the Japanese bring their, uh, their surface fleet back very, very uh, early with a low roll. I think, however, they're probably going to build a step. Uh, let's see what's available here, actually. They can build an Australian step or an Indian step, or they can build one of these one, 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 ones. But these are also their detachments, which they're going to need to put out. And they don't get a lot. Oh, they do get some units. They get some more colonial units, and that's about it. So an Australian unit, or an Indian unit. An Indian unit can actually be, go somewhere, so it gets has to be built somewhere in India, as I recall. So we're going to put it there. 
And then the, Nash, the, the nationalists can build one and they can build their EXP unit here as well. Remember that the uh, countries that have EXP units are allowed to stack with each other. The EXP units ignore all rules, but normally minor country steps cannot stack with or attack with each other. So this way allows the uh, allies here to work together, these different Chinese groups. All right. So, ooh, I just realized something. I think this can act as a replacement location if it's placed here. Now, that's not a good spot because the Japanese can attack it and it's going to be on its own. It's definitely not something they want to do. But if they could ever build a line of like units like here and here, then this unit could be standing inside Kiangsu. And I think a supplied headquarters inside your home country acts as a reinforcement location for that country. That's really where Kiangsu has a problem. Um, oh, you know what? The Axis gave up Nanking. <laughs> I misremembered how that ordering would go. Somebody was looking at me going, what are you doing, dude? So let's say that they properly, you know, moved that unit over during the, uh, during the operational and reserve movement phases. Let's not let Japan be that dumb. So this is definitely going to be the situation. This is going to be the situation here. So what else can happen? I think that's all they can do. They got the British unit added. And now there is one thing that happens at the end of this turn. The British Far Eastern forces, if Britain's posture is war, place these counters in the delay box. So they get a headquarters, they get an air force, thankfully, and they get, more importantly, a convoy troop because they don't even have convoy troops at all here. Oops, I think I sent that to the wrong place. Let me just go to the delay box. There we go. So um, they can't even move units across oceans if they wanted to yet. They might be able to soon, but not yet. So that's going to be the end of the British uh, American uh, on here. Now we're going to go over to Europe and find out what the, uh, the Soviets had up their sleeve. It's their Eastern Bloc. This is everybody's playing diplomacy here. That must just be my... Um, <laughs> my personal inclination is summer of 1938. That's your diplomacy time. Technically, the Allies could have played a support uh, Republicans in Spain during that moment. It might have been the right call. They went with the Entente instead. I just kind of chose that for them. So Eastern Bloc, Russia is going to get one step. And in this case, uh, let's put it right in Smolensk. Uh, then these guys uh, are going to come by, but that's after. Now they got to pick their next card. We had a plan for them. It's demand Baltic states, which could backfire. We'll see. Then we get the Eastern Bloc. Political events roll minus one is a one is conflicting plans, no result. Too bad. Next, they are going to do the combination that I referred to a moment ago. That's going to go back to the force pool. And this guy is probably going to try and figure out where he should be. We want him to go one, two, and then three. That's probably, if, in case we're worried about a German blitz through the Baltic states, you want to have something on that rail line. That's just very important. Uh, similarly, we're going to want something on this rail line here if we're worried about Romania joining the Axis. We have time to worry about that later, but I, I like to get started. So uh, the Russians are now going to try their naval shipbuilding. They needed a one. They got a three. So let's head over to the Eastern Russian forces and see what they've got. Of course, packed with China, and that is finally going to allow Kiangsu, Kansu, dang it, to get in better shape. So packed with China means that these are all going to the delay box. So some new forces for the uh, Kansu Chinese. And then they're going to pick their next card. Did they have one? Yes, aid to China. They're going to send extra aid down to the nationalists and try to help them build up lots and lots of steps if they have replacement locations for them. Then during the political, political event segment, they're going to roll a die and try to make something happen. A five to a four cr cabinet crisis table. This is very good for the allies. The cabinet crisis table is essentially representing the chaotic nature of of the Japanese, and this could do some bad things to them. The government is in a bit of a disarray. The army and navy are fighting. Something's going on. Let's find out what it is. A five, no adjustment. Wait a minute. No adjustment. That's right, because it was a, a, a zero at the beginning. It's called a power shift. So power shift is one of the only ones that's actually kind of good 
for the Axis. If the Japanese government marker is in its holding box, the Axis faction may flip the marker over. So I don't think it's there, however. No, it's not here. It must be on the turn track somewhere. Yeah, it's coming back at the end of the summer, and then the Axis can decide where they like to place it. It's probably going on the Navy, uh, but it might go on Army if they really want to try blitzing into, in, into China, which is working out pretty well for them so far. So unfortunately for the Western... Uh, sorry, the Eastern Soviets, that did not have the effect they would have preferred. It has no other effects there. However, they do get to build. Do they have a Chinese step to build? No, but they can break this guy down, uh, flip him over. Oh, no, they can't break him down. Not even, not yet. They're going to have to wait a little bit because they'd already built him up mobilization. So they're going to have to wait until they get those reinforcements to build the other option. Other option in this case, meaning uh, the headquarters. Okay. So that seems like we're done with the whole turn. Let's go do some delay rolls and then we should be done. All right. Let's start with the naval warfare delay box. Let's see when, how long it's going to take for that I boat to come back. A three. Lucky for the Axis. If it was a six, they would have taken a lot longer to come back. So now they're going to get it here in uh, the beginning of fall. Meanwhile, we've got a couple of rolls here. Ooh, very, very good for the Axis. They get uh, their headquarters there. They get their logistics marker back right away. And then they've got four and three. So not great on the surface fleet, but also not terrible. And the troop convoy is beginning available soon. Now let's check out what the allies are doing. Two, four, six, two, four, six. I'm gonna bring drag this down for these. Uh three, four. So we don't really care. You know, they don't they don't care much about where that uh is coming. Um that troop convoy is a bit more important. And unfortunately, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Do they wanna roll on that air force? To re-roll it. Oh boy, howdy. I don't know. I don't think they... They do have an air unit on this map. I think they want to re-roll the Air Force. The Air Force is their only chance, so they're going to re-roll the Air Force. The six down to a two. Do the Axis want to fight that with their own luck marker? Probably not. I think they're going to save their luck marker for a... Uh, for another time. So now uh, the Air Force is actually coming out two turns from then. However, the... We're going to have to re-roll the luck marker here in a second. That was the six, and this is a four-two. And then the last one was a three for the headquarters, which I don't know how effective that's going to be. And then the Allies get one more luck that's six. Whoa, one, two, three, four, five, six. Good news for Japan. The Allied luck marker's gone for a very long time. Soviets are one, four. So Soviets get this get back immediately. And then these two come back right here. So that's the end of this turn. We do have one, the Bismarck to determine. A three plus an 11 is a 14. Uh, and this is summer. I forgot to move these guys out. Uh, there should have been one more battleship out there. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. 4, 8, 12, 13, 14. So the Bismarck is going to be available in late 1941. So that's not too terrible. Meanwhile, let's put these where they need to go. The American ships will need to go in. Uh, we're just going to put them in not, not uh, Honolulu. And then the Axis will go where they go. And the last thing that happens is all these ships sort of return to base at the end of the turn. To be used again, although we don't have the surface fleet marker anymore, not for a while. When do we determine? Uh, fall, uh, which is unfortunate because it means that the south monsoon zone will be, uh, will be covered in mud. So we won't be able to do the planned landing in Rabal, I believe. When did we see that was going to be? It was going to be September. Do the Allies want to re-roll that surface? The Axis, one, two, three. It was a four for the surface fleet. Yeah, so this is the weather when our, uh, when our surface fleet returns. And we were hoping to land down here in order to put a logistics marker down there or something. Now, 
I'm thinking we could use it to land over here and then march south to try to take Singapore. If we can take Singapore, it really limits what the Allies are going to be able to do. Um, they're going to have to get Christmas Island, and then they're going to have to get Darwin, and then they can kind of bring stuff this away. But for now, they really can't. I think we're going to hold off on using the luck marker. It might be better used against the Chinese, even though I, I'm not super happy with how that turned out. All right, we're done with May, June. Let's go to June, July on both maps. And you can see that keeps our, our, our mud weather here. And while we'd really like to do something down here, we won't be able to. Uh, back to Europe. We've got the Axis rolling on their diplomacy table. They're really hoping for a three. Oh, a four to a three, conflicting plans, no result. And I think that's going to be it for them. So we head over to Japan, who has some things to consider. Now that it's Mud, the savior, <laughs> Mud, the savior of the, uh, of, of the nationalist Chinese, um, they have to decide what their plan of action here is. They'd really like to smash this. They have a card thing to play. No, they've got nothing on their cards. So they don't have, they can't place an air unit over here. That's unacceptable. That's not, not going to happen. When is their air unit coming back, actually? Do they, they didn't get it in their force pool yet, right? No, they still have the CV fleet. Um, and means we're going to be able to make another base attack, um, which actually reminds me, do we want to move the British fleet? These need to go to, what is this? Yeah, these need to go to the force pool. These come out and need to go to the British fleet. So I think now you have to determine, do the allies on their turn move their fleet out of Singapore? If they leave it in Singapore, the Axis are just going to keep launching attacks against it. And heck, they might even be more successful this time. However, if it's not in Singapore, it can't contest a landing that's going to be coming in the near future. Yeah, considering the Allies knew... Well, the Allies actually didn't know last turn how long that surface fleet would be out of action when they were making this decision. They could say, guess, and hope that moving their fleet out would make more sense. But at this point, if the Axis got really lucky on their surface fleet and they got it back, you know, oh no, they knew the weather was going to be bad. That's right. So if the weather is bad, they can move their fleet. If the glove fits, you must acquit. If the weather is bad, you can move your fleet. So I think the Allies are going to move their fleet back to Calcutta. and. That will be, you know, just to avoid getting raided by the Axis for the next several turns. And then what's going to happen is when they get to this autumn turn, they'll move it back down to Singapore because they know that the following turn, the Axis have the ability to land near Singapore and they're going to want to be able to contest that. They're also going to be able to do it with a lot more potential ships, including some air units, maybe potentially whatever is going to happen there. So the Axis may have lost the easy opportunity here. We'll see. Um, the CV fleet is probably going to run some cover for the surface fleet by trying to place a uh, CV strike marker directly on top of Singapore. So we'll see how well that works. Meanwhile, we're still on Japan's turn and they have to decide what they're doing now, uh, which is they can't do that strike there and they now have to pick up their beachhead. So that goes back to force pool. That's during the beachhead maintenance uh, uh, failure sections. Uh, support units, they don't have any they can place, right? They have a CV fleet, but they can't really use it at the moment, certainly not in the mud, and they can't use it to place a beachhead down here. That's an unfortunate reality of the CV fleets is you can see they can be placed in an all-sea hex, but it, does, but it has to be flipped to its CV strike side. That's all they're used for. They're either used to fight other naval units or they're used to... Uh, do a CV strike to support some kind of a landing or a coastal fight. Uh, they can't be used to create beachheads the way that surface fleets can. So that having been said, no support segment, uh, no organization segment. Are they going to want to break anything down? They could. 
uh, keep this unit there. I don't think they want to combine that unit. They're going to want to go and grab this other port, I believe. Maybe during the detachments phase. They do have something to do there. So let's pop open that and put a detachment down in the Sarawak area. Now, that is a really, really important area. So I don't think we're ever going to leave it unguarded by at least one step. But the detachment is there in the future if we absolutely needed it. If we ever run low on detachments, we might pick that one up with the expectation that we're always going to leave a detachment there. Um, the other option... Yeah, we're going to put one detachment here in Nanking as well. to help cover that. Uh, oh, you know what we didn't do last turn? We didn't place our Japanese steps. Uh, we got two Japanese steps, one colonial, one regular. So let's go ahead and take care of that. So we got a colonial step that would have been buildable in Shanghai or in Formosa technically, but I think Shanghai is a better place for it. And then they would have got a regular step as well that could have been built in Kyushu. Okay, so now I think we're caught back up to this turn where we were trying to determine breakdowns and the best they could do here is 8 to 6. That is not good odds. We're going to need to wait for good weather uh, and get an air unit involved and get a lot more units down here. So, oh, a detachment in Hong Kong is also something we should do. So let's go ahead and add that. Jeez, we're running out of detachments very quickly, but we do need them guarding these important areas uh, because now this unit's allowed to leave there. That is slightly less important than losing Nanking. If we lose Hong Kong, it can't do anything for the West while they while it's empty. They have to have a detachment or a garrison there, and getting one there is going to be very difficult for them. So. I don't mind losing, leaving that empty. So that's probably the case. So now we're going to see what we can move. We're going to move this guy over here. This guy can move up. Maybe we break him apart. Yeah, we break him apart in order to have one unit stay behind guarding Canton next turn. We break him apart next turn. This turn doesn't really matter. Uh, this unit can move down here. And then we got to figure out what to do with this guy that landed in Kyushu. He could go to Formosa this turn, and then next turn, he go from Formosa to Hong Kong or Formosa to Sarawak. That's probably the right call. Meanwhile, this colonial step can zoom along the rail to here, and then during... Uh, Reserve it can move here, which frees this guy up to move here, which frees this guy up to move down to Wuhan to guard that. Oh, and we needed one in Changsha too. Oh my God, the, there's so many, so many problems here. We're gonna use one more detachment in Changsha for now. Um, Changchao could also use a detachment. And I'm out of detachments, <laughs> just like that. We know that there are some that we might get rid of, uh, like the one in. Wuhan might go away. I might just leave a unit there all the time. Um, the colonial steps will help us replace them. As the colonial steps come in, we'll be able to replace the detachments and have them go elsewhere. So I think that's good. And the air units, we talked about moving those down here. Now, do we move the fleet down to Sarawak? Not until we're ready to actually whack the, the main attack here, I think. Because if we have our fleet at Sarawak, we have the same problem that they had. They can then do attacks against me, base strikes. And there's not much we can do about it if we're there. If we're up here, at the very least, it's much harder for them to do it because they have to make speed checks. No, wait. In order for them to do that, they need to, um, they need to be able to have a CV fleet. And... They do not have a CV fleet over here. So I think we're safe moving this fleet down to Sarawak right now. Although, you know, I'm probably going to leave this up here and do this by taking a new fleet and forming it down there and just kind of taking everybody except for like maybe one cruiser. Let's take everybody for now. We're going to leave Formosa 
mostly empty. We'll put back... Where do I have that one fleet? The one fleet is way up there. This is what we're going to have. We have a fleet down in truck. That's not made up of much. But just in case later we realize we needed that, we're going to have it. So we've now got our fleet down in Sarawak. And I think... We're good to go on all of our operational moves. I don't have any attacks yet because mud weather is making that really bad for us. Oh, operational move. This guy goes here and in reserve he goes here. And now we've got another port where our air units can potentially go. In fact, these air units can rebase anywhere, as I recall. I think we're going to rebase them to Sarawak itself because that will give us more options with regard to... Uh, in fact, we could have these air units do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are the air units I want down there. And then I want those two three fours over here. Because the three fours, they don't even need to have two of them, actually. We can rebase one of them down to there. Um, we only need one kind of close to the Chinese front that can act as an air support marker. Uh, as, a, as a task force or an air, air support marker up there. But the LBAs down here will give us options to attack this, not with base strikes from our fleet, but with air strikes from our air units, which might be just as effective against that. Okay. Meanwhile, we're now going to look at what our reserve moves might look like. Do we have any reserve moves? That guy's going to stay there. That guy was going to stay there. Actually, no, these guys can slide down. We're going to leave this detachment here and bring those guys down there. In which case, we didn't need this detachment here. Again, I, I give myself leeway while I'm playing to try to keep this thing fast for you guys. The Formosa step is kind of stuck there, unless we wanted to use a scratch convoy to send it down to Sarawak. But I don't think we do. I think we want to use nothing. Oh, Oh, you know what? We could move this guy in reserve down to Formosa. So now we've got two guys in Formosa, and we can either send them down to Sarawak or we can send them down to Truck. Sarawak, because we know that the, the weather down here is going to be real bad when our uh, surface fleet gets back. Um, specifically, it's going to be bad for two turns after our surface fleet gets back. So we're going to need to use the surface fleet to try and do something over here. That's the plan. All right, next up, we're at the conditional events phase, so we get another allied colonial step, which we're going to put again. Can we go in Formosa this time, get a little bit closer to the front? Or, yeah, we'll put it in Shanghai. And then a regular step is going to go in Kyushu. We're running out of steps here. We're going to have to start building up the Kwang Tung army at this point. Um, but don't worry, next summer we'll get more Japanese steps, and we'll probably get some killed in the winter while we go in the offensive against the Chinese. All right, that's Japan's long turn. Sorry for that. Uh, now we're going to go over to the West in Europe. They've got their diplomatic role. A two reduced to a one is another diplomatic success in the Central. Let's see what that brings us. Three minus one to a two is Austria. It's going to cancel out the Austrian influence. That is not great for the German plan. That's pretty bad, actually. Uh, they were really hoping to get Czechoslovakia again. Germany was because it would result in a no effect from the allied role. So Ribbentrop diplomacy really letting us down, whereas the little Entente is doing a good job of convincing these guys in Central Europe to maybe it's going to hit Hungary next and it's just going to run the gamut. All right, uh, but that is going to be it for the West up here. They've done everything they can. They put some ships on 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 patrol, sending them south along uh, through to the Pacific. So let's see about the options for the West over here. They don't yet have the aid marker, right? That's coming back uh, where? Is that here? Yes, aid to China is next turn. Then they can start rolling to get extra Chinese steps each turn. In the meantime, they've got League of Nations, which is going to give them some free steps later on. And do the British have their convoy? No, they don't. That's still on the turn track coming back here. So the unit that's here in Bangladesh, the, it can't even 
It can't even actually like get down to Singapore to help because Siam is in the way. So it can't take the, the road path and it can't take the naval path. Well, that's not great for them. I mean, they built it up. They're trying to do what they can. Um, meanwhile, here's the thing for the allies. They don't want to attack. The Chinese nationalists definitely don't want to attack in mud. What they could do here is really ford up, right? The um, This guy could turn into a port -a fort And then this guy could back up one. And this is pretty strong, but they can't build any new nationalist units. Which is unfortunate. So a ton of stuff just came off of the turn track for the Allies. They now have quite the fleet built up here. Um, it definitely rivals the Axis fleet that they would be fighting, but the Axis has the ability to use their fleet. That's the real difference. I did put the, um, the air units for the Allies in Singapore because the other a scratch defense fleet with an air unit, if I recall correctly. Uh, and they also have the ability to use an air unit because they do have one in their force pool. They just got it here. So they have the ability to play an air unit to cancel some kind of an attack. So they certainly have that option in the near future. All right. Sorry about that, folks. We missed, uh, we lost a little bit of the um, the Russians. They rolled their, their two dice options and they got no results. So now we're back to here. Uh, I did a little retconning as well with the British who are going to have some air units stationed here because they got it. They just got one off the turn track. The other one was sort of their reserve unit that was over in India earlier. We're going to have them actually join the defense of Singapore because they do have an air force unit that they can use to contest it. So I think that's a good place for them. Those air force units can't be like super overwhelmed the way that the fleet could have been on a previous turn. Also, a bunch of British reinforcements just showed up. So even though the, the, the Japanese have a bunch of, of ships, now the British also have a bunch of ships of their own. Uh, so Japan is going to be in a more of a parity situation. Although the British don't have a CV fleet marker, so they can't do base strikes with that. They could do base strikes with this air unit here. Um, and I think... That's what they'll probably try to do in the near future. However, the turn sequencing almost always seems to favor the Axis. The Axis are going to get to the chance to do their base attack against these air units and try to catch them on the ground. We'll see if that winds up being the case. But for now, we are making our way over to the German side uh, for the final turn here. So German's last chance to make the Ribbentrop diplomacy card do anything is a two to a one conflicting plans, no result. Man, they only needed the neutrals pressured one time. Now they're probably gonna have to change a bunch of options around. But next, they're going to see how the Japanese do their final turn. So Japan's final turn is definitely gonna include a base strike. Now that these air units are close enough, the Japanese are going to try to hit them with their own LBAs, I would imagine. Actually, they can send a fleet over, I guess, if they want. But the fleets, the, the carriers are not nearly as effective against LBAs. Now that they have this port that's close enough, they can certainly try and do a sustained attack. They can't do a sustained attack in the mud, but they can find a clear day to make a single base attack. The mud actually does not affect base attacks and sub patrols as far as I can find. So the Axis 
are going to consider... Ooh, I forgot they have a headquarters. They really need to make that happen. That's what they're going to do right now. These two units that are in Canton, they're going to come back and the headquarters is going to go out there before I forget. That's going to really give them a chance to do something next turn. And meanwhile, that's actually going to happen later. Let's do the base strike. Let's resolve it. They're going to use the one heavy air unit that's down here. That is required to uh, do a base strike. And they are going to roll that dice. Um, oop, I did it too early because I forgot to go and look up. Okay, so base attack. It is a two, so there's one combat round with this one LBA. So we get three dice. We are going to target the enemy's heavy in the hopes of damaging it so that it can't target us. So that's what we're going to do here. We get to roll three dice and try to hit it on a six. One, two, three. Oh, dang it. All right. Well, it was worth a shot. And unfortunately, the Japanese are going to be subject to base raids from the allies now on the next turn because they do have a heavy attack fleet that can now hit them. The allied fleet is way back over here. The LBA, the bombers, can go after the fleet that's I've based in Sarawak. Uh, so that knowing that, I think we're going to pull the fleet back to Hong Kong. or Let's do it Formosa. There's no reason not to leave it in Formosa. Oops. Let's leave that there and uh, change our units on this display, actually. Air units being caught on the ground is one thing. I don't want my fleets to be caught on the ground. So until we knock out that enemy heavy air, the Japanese are going to be very careful about keeping a uh, naval unit based here. Those naval units based in Formosa are still close enough to defend the Java Sea. They just aren't as easy. It's just not as easy. They have to make speed checks and such. Okay, so now that we're going to actual, uh, actual turns here. I think we want to do this. And we want to do that. And we want to do this. And this colonial unit can come up to here. And that's right, we had a plan for these guys. We were going to move the troop convoy to the South China Sea and bring them down here. In fact, we can start shuffling these guys down to maybe do a naval invasion directly into Singapore rather than trying to land up here and then coming at it down there because we're right across the, the strait now so we can walk two steppers onto it. That might be a consideration. All right. Meanwhile, over here, I think we've moved everything that we wanted to maneuver. Uh, those guys would need to group up, group up, and then I don't know what that guy's going to do later. So our colonial units are kind of spreading out a little bit to cover various areas. I think this guy's actually going to go down here. No, I decided that's right. We don't have to worry about the ba partisan base coming out for many, many turns. We do have to worry about this getting zapped in the near future. All right. So that's probably the last of the Japanese deployments for now. So we're going to head over to the west. They've got one last shot at their diplomatic card. Let's see if it does it. A one is a success. The central area table is two to a one is a no result. Okay. Germany breathes another sigh of relief. Ribbentrop diplomacy has utterly failed them, but at the very least, they, uh, they didn't have to deal with another little entente kicking off. So back over to the U.S. over here. Now that they have the Chinese aid marker, aid to China marker down here, they can potentially get a new step every turn. So let's see if they can do that. They're really hoping they nail it this time. Uh, but in the meantime... What can they do? What can they do? I think they have to hope. They really have to hope that they can get another uh, national Chinese uh, Kiangsu unit out here. So they're going to turn off the port of fort This guy's going to back out. This guy's going to turn his fort on. So it's not very strong anymore, but... They do now have room to place another nationalist Chinese out there because we're going to run out of these white ones very quickly. Uh, in fact, I think we almost have. 
we have so many of these blue guys, but we can't build them anywhere except in one of the, in this city. Um, so that is probably the risk they're going to take. It's still four with three shifts. So the Japanese are going to have a really hard time taking that next turn, even though we pulled the strongest unit out of it. Now we're going to roll on aid to China. And you can see aid to China right here on a one, two, or three, China gets an infantry step. However, limited war is in effect. So China is getting less aid than normal. The Burma road is not quite open yet, so to speak. Um, not at full speed. So we're going to roll and China is hoping for a one or a two. They got it. They got the unit. Excellent. They really needed that extra unit. So now they can bring out a one, one, one is actually uh, their strongest unit. So that's going to come out right here. And then that will give them some opportunities in the near future. And now they have a five defense there. That is considerably better. I wonder if this unit goes here instead to provide some kind of a, a bulwark against being flanked. This guy is going to need... Yeah, I think that's exactly what he's going to do. Uh, he wants to make sure that they can't completely flank around and get too many hex sides. All right, so that is very good for the Allies. They're going to hold the Japanese at this line, hopefully. And next we are... Sorry, do we have a role on the League of Nations? No, we just have regular, uh, regular steps to play with. So now we get another nationalist Chinese step, and that's this unit coming out here. And then we get another British step, which I guess needs to be one of these 1-1s, one and that has to appear in the East Africa box. I'm sorry, Europe slash Africa box. And it can maybe move out somewhere useful when they get convoys. And at this point, I almost forgot, they are going to do a base strike, and they're going to attack the opposing heavy air units. So that is coming back over here. The raid can f include one heavy LBA, but not both. So now they're rolling on this table with no special modifiers. One or a two? Nope. Oh, no. Oh, no. A six is Raiders Discovered. So Raiders Discovered means that the Axis kind of panic a little bit. And uh, this, unfortunately, they have to send their CV fleet to the uh to the delay box did they want to play oh they couldn't play their logistics marker not until not until fall um so they have to send that cv fleet to the delay box but on the other hand they do get to intercept the heavy bomber here um and they get i think normal rounds of combat so we've only had the regular um Regular, com uh, regular strike before, but let's actually do and play out a, a little battle here between, this is the raiding force and the, uh, and, and the Axis were able to bring out a interception force of any LBA they wanted. Technically they could have also used carriers, but LBAs are much more effective to uh, intercept other LBAs. So in this case, they chose a light LBA because it has much more offensive power than the heavy LBA. So this is a day action. In this case, the phasing faction is the uh, British player gets to roll two attacks. They're hoping for sixes only. They got a hit. Wow. Okay. And that hit is then going to roll how much damage is done. Another four. So that is actually going to destroy this LBA. If it had been a two or three, it would damage it, but it's actually going to destroy it uh, completely which means it's going to go onto the turn track for a little bit if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So, but before that, they get to hit back with four shots. One, two, three, four. No sixes. Very disappointing for the Japanese. The pilots going to need to go commit seppuku. But in this case, if the total equals... Yeah, we got the defense factor. So the end result is that this guy goes into the destroyed box, place LBAs in the delay box. So they, 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 they properly caught on to the raid, they intercepted them, and then got royally destroyed by the, I don't know, heavy mosquitoes, maybe, that were coming in on the bomber raid. There must have been some really good British uh, coordination there. Maybe they brought up some interceptors just the right time to help fight the Japanese interceptors. Either way, that's disappointing for Japan, but they only lost a light LBA. 
their heavy LBA is still here, so they can still conduct raids against Singapore in the near future. So the six is still overall good for Japan. It just could have been better if they managed to get some hits in that. All right. So now I believe we're definitely done with the nationalist Chinese uh, and the and the West. So we go over to Europe for the last roll on the Soviet Eastern Bloc card. They have rolled several times. A one is another no result. What about this roll, Russia? Can you get this pack with China going? Not if you roll a three. Nope. No results. Okay. Thanks for playing, Russia. Your your diplomatic efforts have been noted. Um, yeah. Not sure what they're going to do with that, but... Oh, I, I forgot to build another unit again. Um, the Japanese units should have been a third colonial unit, which I think we're going to place in Formosa. And then we would have had another unit we could have built up in Kyushu. Okay. So now that we've properly done all that, we gave the British and the Nationalist Chinese all of their steps. Ch Chinese got three, British got one. Um, nobody else got any steps. So I think that's going to be the end of summer, ladies and gentlemen. That summer took a long time. I was really hopeful that we'd be able to get to two seasons each for most of this pre-war period in Europe, but I think we're going to be reduced to one season per video uh, for the for the foreseeable future. So let's do our, our quick delay rolls here. We do have uh, really just one for, oh, sorry, the CV fleet. That's right. In order to conduct the counter-strike or, the, or the, um, the Raiders discovered event, the Axis had no choice. They had to throw their CV fleet into the delay box, not the Naval Warfare delay box, at least. So let's see, they get a one and a six. Okay, so it's really good that they get their CV fleet back, but it's really bad that their best interceptor is going six ahead on the turn track. They're not gonna, they're gonna have to rebuild those things, train new pilots, uh, that was all their best, new, most modern zeros. Now they're using the older ones uh, in, in all of these these fleets here. So, or the air LBAs, I should say. All right, that having been said, we advance the turn marker is one of the last things that we do here. And a lot of this stuff needs to get put out. I'll do that right now. 